Mike. Oh, wow. I got it. So I'll give everyone a minute. We're interested to hear what are the major challenges and drivers. Rates is a big one. Funding for infrastructure improvements. Growth, PFOS, yes, here they come. <laughs> Political opposition, a lot of um, needs around funding, construction impacts. Regulatory changes, absolutely. Um, thank you all for sharing. And you, I'm hoping that the information we share will be of value to you guys as you embark on some of the engagement efforts needed to over overcome the challenges that our public utilities are facing. So as Shelly mentioned, we'll be walking through a, a pretty simplified six step um, framework for community engagement. And we'll end with a uh, case study from Clackmas showcasing how Shelly adapted this approach to foster long-term relationships in their community. So step one um, is about developing your vision for the effort. So this is really about getting aligned around your why. What are you looking to accomplish these, through these engagement efforts? Are you looking to provide general awareness and education? Are you looking for feedback that will help drive your project's next step or influence perhaps the scope of your project? Um, it's very important to understand what your desired outcomes are from your engagement. Are you looking for a one point touch base with your ratepayers, or are you looking to establish longer term partnerships? Aligning around your vision is incredibly important to make sure that you're leveraging the appropriate tools to engage your stakeholders. Step number two is about establishing your internal team who's going to help you deliver this work. Oftentimes in our public utilities, we have a single point of contact who might be responsible or a small team for delivering outreach and engagement, might be your public information officer, your communications manager. And today we're hoping to showcase the value of developing a diverse internal team to deliver your engagement efforts. Uh, we really believe the strongest teams are a group that have diverse backgrounds. So your technical leads paired with your communications professionals, um, and others in your organization is what is going to ultimately deliver a really effective engagement strategy that has all the necessary technical information, but also leans on best communication practices. So step number three is about defining your stakeholders for the project. Um, really important to systematically and thoroughly think through who is going to be impacted by this effort. And likewise, who has influence over the outcomes of your project? Um, again, we want to encourage everyone to think about the diverse stakeholders in your community and begin to explore what are their particular and unique concerns related to your projects, what are their interests, what are their values, um, and ultimately, again, this will drive your approach to engaging with these stakeholders. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about step number four, which is establishing the research methods to begin this discovery process, um, learning what approaches are going to be best fit for your stakeholders that you've identified. So it's important to think about what type of engagement you're leading, going back to that vision and objectives that will ultimately drive the research methods that you invest in. So we'll look at a couple together. One-on-one uh, -on -one interviews are a really effective way for you to get honest and open dialogue with highly influential stakeholders for your project. Um, this is an opportunity for you to have dialogue, again, open conversations. And as you can see, this is obviously a more time-intensive research method, so it really should be reserved for those of the project that are kind of most influential. So thinking about your boards, perhaps your council, important to get a deep dive, hearing from them, their values, interests, and priorities. Focus groups are another opportunity to have dialogue and build relationships. Uh, focus groups allow you to put together kind of a cross section of your community in the same room to share ideas, express concerns, um, and still have that kind of open dialogue rather than 
The next approach would be an online survey, which I know a lot of us are very familiar with. Um, online surveys are extremely effective to gather both quantitative and qualitative data. So you can have people rank their priorities. You can also um, build in some open-ended questions to get people's feedback. Um, online surveys are very cost-effective. They're easy to replicate. So they're an effective tool to um, track change over time, how people's opinions, behaviors, interests have evolved over time. And then we've got some more creative strategies looking at an open house or perhaps ho hosting a event, a tour at your facility. This is another opportunity to get community input in a more informal, personal manner. And then lastly, public polling is a kind of statistically driven research method that oftentimes involves using perhaps a third party polling effort. Um, this could be a tool if you're looking to garner feedback on a particular policy or initiative and having that statistically supported data might be important to your decision makers. So again, a little bit more costly um, and probably the most robust and depending on your goals and interests, it's a tool that can be leveraged. So step number five is uh, just about evaluating your findings from the research. And what we really wanted to highlight here is that it's important to not just report out your findings to those decision makers, but also to take the time to report your findings to those who took the time to invest and participate in your survey or your polling, right? Transparency is ultimately what builds public trust. And um, it's, it's important that the folks that you met with, that you heard from, can see their thoughts and their, their opinions reflected back to them. It's an opportunity to confirm that you've got it right. And it's an opportunity to demonstrate how you're gonna use the information collected. And step six is about putting your plan to action. So what are you gonna do with the information that you've gathered from the community? How is it gonna impact your project? Um, and it's really about putting together both a short and long-term approach so that folks can see that their input had some level of outcome that drove some level of action from your agency. Um, it's obviously much easier said than done, but luckily we have Shelly here with us today who's gonna showcase how Clackamas took this framework and applied it to build long-term relationships in their community. Thank you, so I think, can you hear me better now? I don't have to <laughs> shout like I felt like I was originally. So I just wanna say, you know, having a regional story that was complex, as complex as Wes's, really challenged us to think about where we started. And I just wanna give a shout out for WSC because they were really amazing partners in this collaboration in developing this framework and the methods that we chose to lean in on. So I really do feel like it was a true partnership and I'm delighted to be able to share our journey with you today. But first I wanna talk about the challenges we were facing and continue to face. Do any look familiar, right? Look at that one in the middle, rising costs. Two years ago, we were working on a public engagement effort to garner public support for a new outfall project. It, it involved requiring voter approval to put our pipe underneath a public park. Now, when we went out and we started talking about that new outfall project, the cost was around 22 million. It is now around 44 million. So what we need to remember is garnering public support and understanding around these complex issues is a continuous engagement effort because as our costs are rising and affordability and our workforce changing, it's making sure that our partners, our stakeholders and communities are brought along with us in the process. So I'm going to use that six step framework to guide us through this conversation. Step one, vision and desired outcomes. As Wes looks to the future with a new regionalized lens, our vision is to be known as a collaborative partner in building a resilient clean water future where all people benefit and rivers thrive. The clean water exchange was a critical first step towards that vision. 
At West, we understand that a clean water future is interdependent on our ability to build trust, garner stakeholder understanding and support, and more importantly, to build that future together. So how do we do that? Well, the second step, establish a team. As we developed a multidisciplinary team that viewed customer service and stakeholder engagement from a variety of lenses, and why do you think that's important? So I'm gonna start asking questions here, moving from storyteller to engager. Why is it important? Haley addressed a few reasons. Does anybody know? Anybody wanna share? Because as these different groups, finance, customer service, public, and government affairs, policy and regulations, our folks in environmental education, we're all engaging with the public every day from a variety of perspectives. So it takes all of us to really develop an outreach effort, a listening, a discovery process that can bring meaning back that together we can implement and then create action from what we've learned. Step three. Define your stakeholders. Because we brought so many diverse members from around our team within our agency, we really felt that we were able to develop the most strategic stakeholder will that would help us achieve our goals. And so one of the things that's really important is to step back and think, what's in it for your stakeholders? Besides what we're hoping to achieve from this process, what's in it for your stakeholders? So what do we want them to know and why would it matter? So from the very beginning, as we started to invite people into the process to help us to design a more inclusive future around clean water, we asked them, you know, what we would help their participation would help us align their priorities with shared values, inform and engage others in our work, and to build a sustainable clean water future that we could implement together. So the research methods that we chose to align with interviews, focus groups, and the online survey and engagement. So the interviews were reserved for people who had the strongest and deepest knowledge about our work, who we are, what we do, and why we matter. The other part of that, you could think, well, some of those folks could certainly be put into the focus group category, but if you think about that high touch, that deepest inclusive way of listening, think about the folks who might have known you for a long period of time, been around transitions of leadership, have a past history. Remember, we do serve seven cities and unincorporated areas. You also might invite someone to an interview because maybe they have a lot to say or they don't wanna say what they have to say in front of another group. Or maybe there's someone who you're a little bit worried they could take the focus group off track by contributing too much. So really the one-on-one -on -one interviews are a safe and inclusive way to ensure that you're listening to those key stakeholders in a way that's meaningful to them and to the process. The second is the focus group. So remember that stakeholder wheel that we were showing you earlier? One of the strategies we used, and it required a lot of thought from the group, was we brought those stakeholders together to those focus groups to be able to share their contributions. Now, in those focus groups, a qualifier was that they had to have some to a deep knowledge, again, of our work, some type of connection. That door could be through a watershed council who worked on a restoration project, or it could be somebody who's been on our advisory committee for a number of years. But the idea is that they had to have some knowledge. And the value in bringing those diverse groups together is that they learn from each other. If you only bring in your business customers or your environmental educators, they're gonna talk to each other from a common language. But in this way, it really lifts up and improves the process. But then we stepped back and we said, you know, the whole part of this process is to develop new clean water champions. So in our online survey and engagement page, we said anybody who cares about the future of clean water should be invited to be a part of this conversation. And so we really spent a lot of time and energy thinking about how we could reach out, 
through our classroom partners, our schools. We really used our system in a comprehensive way to help us get the word out. But we also wanted to make sure that this survey, at least a piece of it, was targeted directly to those rate paying customers. Because remember those challenges we were talking about earlier? They're gonna be paying those bills and carrying that cost. So we wanted to make sure that we were listening directly to them. One of the common denominators throughout all three processes is that your questions need to align. They can't be identical, but they need to build on one another. So you start at the highest level with the online survey and engagement page, and then you take it and you deepen it a step more into the focus group. And then you go to the deepest level and getting behind the why in the interviews. So what did we learn? And this is where I'm gonna engage you. So I really do hope this is a participatory process. So let's start with the online survey and those key findings. Again, as it relates to garnering stakeholder understanding and support, what do you think we learned that will help us with those challenges that we just discussed earlier? And it's hard for me not to wanna move around and, and go up here. So what do you, what do you think we learned? that will help us. Laura Lang, can I call on you? What do you, what do you think we, what did we learn? No, no, I, I can tell, I can tell a lot of folks are. So I'm gonna help you out and then maybe you can jump in. So it helped us understand, this is again, the survey. Remember those who have maybe just very, very little to some understanding of who we are, what we do and why we matter. So it helped us understand where that familiarity circle is, right? Most people know, oh yeah, you're the, you guys do wastewater treatment. And then a few kind of gets a little lower, still more in a management, and then they might know us through customer service or billing. So understanding the door that people are familiar with you is really important. And then also what they're interested in learning more about. Why is that important? Well, if you're a communicator, you want to talk to people, you want to get them to care about you. If you want their support, first they have to be willing to listen. So understanding what they're interested about, then maybe you produce stories, events, or happenings, right, that draws them into that door. And then the community engagement ideas. Again, what was one of our original goals? We want to partner in a clean water future, not dictate a clean water future. And so these are some ways in which people said, here's how we would like to be involved in your work together. Anything else seem relevant? Ah, how about preferred communication? Oh, thank you. Yeah, it was on there, but these were the top three. Okay, yeah, sure. I don't want to I don't want to interrupt the the flow. Okay, well Hunter, let's let's do it then. We can do that. Yeah, it's kind of cuz I don't really need my Okay, so you can still hear me here. All right, so we were talking about yes, yeah, so it was interesting and I've done this now several times in surveys and focus groups of this nature and it's always surprising to me that people Email always rises to the top, right? Newsletter, it's a great way to tell our story. And again, these are recommendations to us. And then direct mail is still a thing, right? Um, and actually what was interesting in the survey, when we sent out the direct mail piece and followed up by our um, email to our direct rate paying customers, the bump went up. We could see immediately the impact from that direct mailer. Anything else on here, right? What the environmental priorities are. So we can talk about clean water, but what does it mean, right? People care about their drinking water. I mean, I think it's on the radar now more than ever, but being able to make that connection. Anything else right here? Clean water in rivers and streams was the highest rated clean water value. So when we communicate, make that connection. Okay, so now this is 
This is another test as we're listening out there. Hopefully the, the fog is, is rolling off now. But this is, the, this is the door. So when they came to that online survey, there was a section that anybody could, you know, complete. But then there was also, it said, do you identify as a West customer? And if they said yes, and they went to that second part of the survey, this was what we were asked. Because we wanted something to start creating a benchmark to evaluate year after year, right? This is a pretty intensive process that we invested in this six work framework, but at some place you have to start creating a benchmark. So this was our goal. Not so, you know, well, happily, not surprising, right? Our customers are saying, yeah, you know, reliable service. You guys are doing a, a great job. Tiny percent still weren't unsure. <laughs> so little opportunity there, but I'm just for the sake of time, I'm just gonna move it down across the spectrum. But I do want you to look at the bottom of these categories under customer satisfaction because do you see how they relate to the goals, how important the goals were that we set up earlier and understanding the challenges we're gonna be facing and why this kind of listening is so important, right? So you get down to this last one, plan and invest in infrastructure. Less than 60% said they were satisfied with the understanding of the work we were doing here. Doesn't mean no one said we were very, doing a poor job, 34% said, I don't know. I, that's why I put that little unsure, because really, Wes overall received uh, high grades. But look at the percentage of people who say, I don't know. That means we have some work to do, people. <laughs> we need to help them because where is the cost, right? Where are the big ticket items that are going to come here? And I think so often we gravitate to the heart of what people also are aligned in interest, watershed health and education and some of those other areas. But our future depends on all of us improving our ability to garner stakeholder understanding so we can get their support here. Okay, so now we're gonna move to the interviews and the focus group and what's working well. Remember the interviews, who are those folks they had some just strong understanding of who we are, what we do, and why we matter, right? Those are people who are closer to us. So do you see any differences here in what we learn? Does anything stand out? I'll just point to one in case you don't. Industry leaders. So Wes is known as strong leaders within our industry. And what does that say? That was a theme. It wasn't one isolated quote. This was a theme. Wes is doing exceptional work with its capital planning. Now, remember ratepayers? All right, and people who know you. So we've got some work to do there. And why do you think, so these are people who know us because this is the big clue. They're, they're on, thank you, Laura Lynn. I, all right, man, I'm so glad, yes. Yes, they are highly involved and engaged with us in some way. So what is the theme? I mean, garnering stakeholder understanding and support is not rhetoric. It's a thing, right? If they are committed and they understand you, they trust you, right? They believe in you. That industry leader, that says trust, right? So what else do we see here? What happens when people know you and they trust you, which is what? This exercise is all about. They see things like, yeah, your budgeting and planning efforts are on the right track. Even though rates are still going up at a modest amount, you're on the right track. That's it. Building trust, getting that support, right? We're in this together. They get, right, the top. This is the top from the people. Wes does an amazing job keeping our rivers clean and our streams healthy. That's what it's all about, clean water, building a clean water future together. But do you think this was a one-time event? Maybe they came to a workshop or, no, this is my boss in the back going to Rotary every single week. This is connecting with our local business alliances, sponsoring the chamber events, spending time outside of the decision-making room with our advisory committee, doing solve cleanups, bringing them down to the Water Reuse Summit and Eugene with us, right? I mean, this is about highly, you know, continuous engagement. 
Okay, so one of the things we asked our folks who know us, we said, what clean water challenges should we be aware of and what could or should we be doing? Now, we purposely did not say WES, Clackamas Water Environment Services. We purposely did not use our name in this, right? We left it open-ended because we wanted to hear what they were concerned about. So, number one, maintaining and strengthening relationships with service area cities. So remember that imagination exercise I shared with you in the beginning? You can ask my boss. We didn't always have great relationships with those seven cities and those unincorporated areas, but we do now. And so, boy, what we heard, again, these are from the people who know us and have been engaged with us. Don't let that slip, right? Don't let that slip. So number two, attracting and retaining highly skilled professionals from operations to senior leadership. This is workforce development. Now, this shouldn't be surprising to us, but this didn't come from us. This came from those people who have high trust for those leaders that are working and managing our organization right now. That's powerful. So when we talk about these words, I hope they're not buzzwords like garnering trust, you know, building relationships. It's real stuff, and it makes a difference. Number three, preventing and managing pollutants and stormwater runoff related to infill, shrinking lot sizes and growth. Leah, this is music to your ears that our, our stakeholders and our partners get this, right? We're in the, we have, like I said, we have a large urban area the Portland metropolitan area, and we are in a housing crunch, affordable housing crunch. So you are going to see high density infill squeezing into those urban areas that we serve. And because we have an engaged stakeholder base, they get it. And they know that we can't solve it alone. So an outcome of this process is what can we do together to ensure we're ahead of this? Number four, Communicating rates and budget information in a transparent and easy to understand format. Our cities right now are not harmonized in their rates. That's an issue. So we need to make sure that all of our communities and our ratepayers understand how those dollars are being collected and spent back into those areas. Really important to garnering trust because it's a complex regionalized story that we're trying to level out and um, make a little bit smoother. So here we are. We've been through the framework. Now we are here at step six. And I think you probably already know what my big ending is, right? Garnering stakeholder understanding support isn't a one-time thing. It's in a continuous investment and engagement that's right for your community. What might be right for Wes might be yours. You need to do the framework, go through it, and listen and learn. But the one thing that we know that came out of this process is that the Clean Water Exchange helped Wes create a strategic communication engagement plan, which paints a picture for a more connected and inclusive future with the many diverse stakeholders and community members that we serve. And together, we really believe we can make a clean water future that benefits all. So thank you. Okay, we have a few minutes for questions. I'll bring the mic to you so that the people on the live stream can hear. Yeah, I have a question on when you were reporting your findings back to your stakeholders, um, particularly some of your more powerful stakeholders, some that have some say over your process. Um, you're obviously not always going to end in a place that reflects what each individual stakeholder wanted. How do you manage some of those relationships and conversations when you're going to a stakeholder whose opinions are not reflected in the final decision? Does that make sense? You know, absolutely. So there are, there are a variety of ways that we're doing that. So we completed a report and then a roadmap. So we wanted to make sure that, first of all, anybody who participated in the process was sent a copy of the report of what we discovered and what we're doing. 
And now we're, now we're embedding it and making it live. So one of the ways we do for all those service area cities is we provide an annual report. So in our annual reports, which are live and printed, we're making sure that we're talking about, here's what we learned and here's what we're doing. So every time we go out, we make sure, it doesn't matter where the conversation is, we always give the community and the stakeholders credit for what we're doing, right? This is what you've asked and this is what we're doing and this is why it matters. So it is continuous for us. We don't always call it the clean water exchange anymore, but we do always let our, our uh, rate payers, our customers and our community, community leaders know that our work is a reflection of what we've learned in the community. Is this on? Okay, thank you. I like it's cutting out a little bit. Uh, well, what's the Metropolitan Wastewater Management Commission? And I did have a question, actually a multiple, probably multiple questions in one, so I apologize. Um, one, when you went out to do the stakeholder engagement, did you have metrics you were trying to hit? Like you want to get so many um, surveys turned in, so, did you have metrics? And then my other two questions are, based on those metrics, did you include measurable objectives in your engagement plan? And do you have the intent to go back out, do another round of um, qualitative and quantitative data collection? Yes, so yes, we definitely set goals. So we had goals for the actual clean water exchange in terms of participation. And then the reason we created that customer service benchmark, so year after year, we can now be able to go back to, to that rate payer base. And we're, we're right now adding, we're going through uh, our own strategic planning updates. We call it performance placamas. And so we're using the 10 attributes of the effective utility management wheel to be able to identify ways and that we can create benchmarks for what we've learned and what we're doing moving forward. If anybody is familiar with the, the EUM processes and the 10 attributes. So we're using the benchmarks outlined in their primer. I'm working with them right now. Any other questions? We've got time for one more probably. So I'm just curious um, if you incentivize the folks who attended the focus group, and if so, what was the incentive? No, we did not. We did not use incentives. However, Clackamas County, so one of the things uh, I don't know that I mentioned, but uh, Clackamas Water Environment Services is both a special district and a department of Clackamas County. And we are doing some testing now around clean water and water awareness through the county lens. And they are in their focus groups using um, to attract a more diverse audience. They are building in incentives into that process. So it's something we, we are moving towards as a county. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks for attending everyone. Thanks to our speakers.